while I'm logging on, let me talk about some coming attractions. Uh, today, I'll be going through the pH problem set, also finish up organic chemistry discussion for this class, and then on uh, Friday, before our actual lab, I will finish up any organic I didn't, go through a couple extra things, and then I'll do the, how many want me to do a review for next test? All right, back by popular demand, I'll do the review for next test on Friday, and then on Monday, I'll go through the organic problem set, and I'll also do some problems that you should practice for test number four. Between now and Monday, probably by Saturday, I hope, Sunday for sure, I'll put up an announcement and you'll get it in your email. Uh, the points and everything break down for test number four. through this. This is all important things you should know. Remember, oh, I haven't said this in a long time. Remember, there's no such thing as a dumb question in my class. So if you have any questions, always, always feel free to ask. And let me just check one thing that I turned on the camera. That would be embarrassing. Is that a good question? Yeah, it is. Yep, it's on. All right, first of all, when it comes to acids and bases, you should know what is an acid. An acid is a proton donor. What is a base? A base is a proton acceptor. All right, now, you should also know the structures of, not the names, I'm not asking you to learn the names, but if I give you a chemical structure, you should be able to identify it. Is it an acid? Is it a base? Or is it a salt? Hopefully all know salt by now. But anyways, how can you tell? Well, if it starts with an H in this class, it's going to be an acid if I ask you. If it starts with an alkali metal, it can be a base if it has OH in it. If it has Cl, it's salt, sodium chloride. And ammonia is one that you should know is a base, an H3, which doesn't fit what I just told you, but how do you learn these? Write them down, say them five times. Write down HCl, acid, HCl, acid, you say it, and by the fifth time, it will be burned into your brain. It works quite well when I teach organic. Now, one of the things that I asked you to learn, and this will be an important information, I just love when I write the water ionization constant, KW, it's named after me. But anyways, One important thing you should know how to use, in the past I'd say you'd have to memorize this, but now, since I'm giving it to you, you just have to know how to use, is that the KW, me, no, water ionization constant is equal to the hydronium ion concentration, H3O plus, times the hydroxide, which is equal at room temperature, 25 degrees C, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. The other thing you should also know that will be given to you this and my special holiday gift to all of you is If 
the hydronium ion concentration is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, then the pH is x. And that's always going to be true when this is either 1 or 1.0. And that's my gift to you. Otherwise, you'd have to pick up your calculator, do the logarithm, then multiply it times minus 1. Well, you don't. All right, let's look and see. If a solution has a hydronium ion concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3, what is the pH of the solution? And is it acidic, basic, and neutral? You notice I didn't catch the bad spacing here. But anyways, uh, let's do the first one. What are we trying to find? pH. What do we give it? The hydronium ion concentration. What do you know? And it will be given to you that. And therefore, if we put it in there, we now know x is my, uh, 3, therefore pH is 3. Now, what I will not give to you on test 4 that I'm asking you to memorize, I've cut down the memorization way low in this class, and that is the following chart or table or however you want to put it. Scale, I guess, would be a better way. And that's the pH scale. pH goes from 0 to 14. At 7, you have neutral. Under 7, it's acidic. And above 7, it's basic. And remember, acidic means the hydronium ion concentration is greater than the hydroxide. At neutral pH, the hydronium is equal to the hydroxide. And at basic pH, the hydroxide concentration is greater than the hydronium. And this chart, this you should sort of have a feel for, but this, hold on, the subtle one said, give that to you. And probably this is one of the most important things I'll teach you that you can use the rest of your life, pH and what it means. So the question is, what's the pH of this? It's 3. Your ass is an acidic, basic, or neutral. It's less than 7. It's acidic. By the way, if you haven't learned, in your stomach, your gastric juice is now way beyond my level of the human body knowledge, my knowledge, because the last biology I had was freshman year high school, not because there's anything wrong with biology, but by then I knew I was going to be a chemist, and the rest of the science classes I took, other than one physics, were chemistry. But anyways, why is your stomach acidic? Well, why is the pH of your stomach about 2? Because there's an acid in there. Your stomach, there are cells in your stomach that make hydrochloric acid, which I think is one of the wonders of life that I have that in my body and you do too. And number five is the same problem. you try one because I don't want to hog all the fun myself. And the question is, if the hydronium ion concentration I could have put up here, 
of a solution is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. What is the pH of the solution? Ready, set, go. And by the way, is the acidic, basic, or neutral? evolving into obnoxious ones. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes I can be very obnoxious. I try not to keep it in check. I'm glad nobody was going like this. I need more time. Going once, twice, let's do it. All right, what are we trying to find? pH. What are we given? <coughs> Is there a time? By the way, my grandmother, that was grandmother Greenman, trained me well. But anyways, what do we know? We know this, pH equals minus the log of the hydronium ion concentration. And that's equal to minus the log of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. And this will be given to you on test number 4. And therefore, x is 11. The pH is not x. Hold on, i got to reboot. It's 11. And that's how you do it. Now, is that acidic, neutral, or basic? pH above 7, basic. And that's how you know that. All right, let's move on. Let's look at number 7. If the solution has a hydroxide concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3, what is the pH of the solution? And is it acidic? Neutral, basic, or neutral. This time I got the spacing right, so you can look. Now, <coughs> pH is minus the log of the hydronium ion constant. Oh no, you are not given that. But you're going to be given on test number four important information this. And you have to do it in two steps. First, you have to solve for the hydronium. How do we do that? Use this equation. We want to solve for that. How do we do that? Divide by hydroxide. By divide by hydroxide, anything divided by itself becomes the number one. And then, whatever I do to one side, I do to the other. Now I'll rewrite it. This cancels out, so I'm left with this. This side will be that. I'll put my numbers in, do the math. I now get minus 11. Ooh, instant repeat. And now, is that the pH? No. pH is minus the log of that. Now I'll do the second step, go from hydronium to pH, and I'll put this in, put it in, pH is 11. Oh, ooh, I was right before, it's still basic. And that's how you do that. Let's do another one of these problems. Let's do number nine. And if a solution has a hydroxide of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11, what is the pH of the solution? And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? And once again, you need two steps because you're not given this, which you need to calculate pH. You are given the hydroxide. You will be given this in test number four. And solve for hydronium, divide by hydroxide. You'll get that. 
and when we write it, remember anything divided by itself comes to number one. This on this rewriting, putting in the numbers, doing the math. This is now the hydronium ion concentration. It's not the pH. And what do you do? Second step, find the pH. pH is minus the log of the hydronium. And therefore, put in the hydronium. You will be given if the hydronium is 1.0 times 10 to the minus x, then the pH is x. Oh, I did it right there. And that's pH 3. Is it acidic, neutral, or basic? pH below 7 is acidic. And 3 is definitely less than 7. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention it, but hopefully you know from 0 to 14 which numbers are larger and smaller than other numbers. I hopefully you've learned that by now in some class. All right, let's talk a little about pH. And one of the things you need to know, which I had earlier, but I erased it because I needed a boardroom, and I'll put it up again. Deja vu. As I, how many of you are familiar with uh, Yogi Berra, who was a great catcher of the New York Yankees and also manager, great manager? And he came up with all these phrases or sayings, and one of them was, oh, deja vu all over again. That's one of my favorite things. But anyways, let's look at that table. Question is, what happens to, and this is important, the numerical value of the pH of a beaker of water at pH 7 if you add a few drops of concentrated NaOH solution. First of all, you have to know NaOH is a base. And when you add a base to something, what happens? It becomes more basic, and therefore the pH will go up. And what happens to the numerical value? It increases. Now, next one, what happens when you add a few drops of concentrated H2SO4? The first thing you have to know is sulfuric acid, H2SO4, like either way, is an acid. And what happens when you add an acid to a solution? It becomes more acidic and the pH goes down and or decreases. Now, next one, but well, before we do that, what happens to the pH at 7 of A? I add some of this, and B, I add some of that. Why don't you think about that? What happens to the pH of a solution of water at 7? I add a few drops of concentrated HCl or a few drops of ammonia. Eight point seven seconds more. <coughs> oh, my clock is stuck. Hold on. Eight point two. Eight point. Oh, I went over. All right. First of all, you should know HCl is an acid. And when we add an acid to something, what happens to the pH? It decreases. If you don't want to write up decrease, you can always put an arrow down. I know what it means, and hopefully you do too. What is ammonia? Ammonia is a base. And when you add a base to something, the pH goes up, increases. If I can spell it right. I think I've said many times I was always the first one down in a spelling bee. <coughs> And the things you should know. Now, let's look at number 11. If what happens to the numerical value of the pH of a beaker of a buffer solution if you add a few drops of the dilute acid solution? Well, buffer solution is a solution that resists pH 
change when you add a small amount of acid or base. So therefore, the answer there is pH stays the same. Next one, B. What happens to the pH of beaker of a buffer solution? You add a few drops of a dilute base solution. Again, buffer solution resists change if you add a small amount of either an acid or a base. And therefore, pH stays the same. And let's go to the next one. And that is this. That reminds me. Let's do something. Let's see if I can. And if you go to the lecture folder in Blackboard, you'll see important information for test number four. If you notice, it's small because I'm not putting anything up for organic chemistry. Organic chemistry, that's something you're going to have to memorize yourself. And anyways, if you notice, I have titrations. Let's come back to that in a second. Let's look at problem 12. Problem 12. If you have to add 1.35 times 10 to the third milliliters of a 1.53 molar NaOH solution to neutralize 1.87 times 10 squared milliliters of an aqueous HCl solution, what is the molarity of the HCl solution? Notice you're being asked to find molarity HCl. Notice you're given this and you're given this. Now, the reason I pulled it up, so you can see I'm not lying to you, which I don't, but let's take a look. Under important information for titrations, how do you know it's a titration? You're neutralizing something. And you're given molarity and usually milliliters of an acid and a base, and molarity of only one of the two acid or base, and you're asked to find the others. And you should know, at neutralization, moles of acid equals moles of base. And that means milliliters of acid times molarity of acid equals milliliters of base times molarity of base. Therefore, if we look at this, we're trying to find the molarity of the HCl. Where you see the word neutralization, that should go like that, wake you up and say, oh, this is a titration. And at neutralization, like I said before, moles, you don't have to write this down, but I will, so you understand how I'm doing the problem. Moles of base equal moles of acid milliliters base times milliliters of acid. I'll put those numbers in. Milliliters of acid, we're trying to find and solve for molarity. How do I do that? I get it alone. I divide this side by that number to get rid of it. Anything divided by itself becomes the number one. And I rewrite it. Molarity of HCl equals this times this divided by that. And the number you get is 11.0. Let's do one more. Look at one more. Oh, let's do 13. And there, if you have to add 115 milliliters of a 0.333 molar HCl solution to neutralize 211 milliliters of an aqueous sodium hydroxide solution, 
what is the molarity of the solution? At neutral, first of all, what are we trying to find? The molarity of sodium hydroxide. Remember, that's the base. You're given how many milliliters? You're given also milliliters and molarity of HCl, which is an acid. And you know at neutralization, moles of acid, moles of base, which is now milliliters of acid times molarity times milliliters of base times moles. You put the numbers in. Oh, we're trying to solve for this. How do you get this alone? Do you divide this side by 211? You have to do that. This side is now molarity NaOH. This is equal to that. Do the math. Remember on test four, like on one, two, and three, and it will also be true in the final, it will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. And Dr. White has learned three significant figures to run. But that's because I grew up doing math on the slide rule. And most people my generation will do that. All right. And the last one, the same thing. Any questions on acids or bases? Can anybody name an acid that you use in your daily life or could use? Let's back up. Or draw the structure, not name it, just draw the structure. Well, you could have put down HCl, H2SO4, or acetic acid, which is found in vinegar. Anybody happen to look at a bottle of ketchup, mustard, or relish? And see it's got vinegar, which is acetic acid, and water, which means all the condiments you put on your hot dogs or hamburgers, I guess you could also for your french fries, if you use ketchup, uh, are acidic. Ooh, do I have time? That one, I do. Many years ago, I worked for this Dutch, Anglo-Dutch company, and being a European company, which American companies then still don't really do, is if you're a visitor in another city, you're given a host. And on the weekend, that host takes you around the places in that city. And I was fortunate enough when I was in the Netherlands and Germany and England to have some very nice hosts. The one thing about being a host, you use your company credit card, you take people to nice places. Well, being located, and I was the only Chicagoan living in the company here in Chicago, everybody else was from New York or New Jersey working here, so I knew Chicago better than they did. And we had this one uh, guest I had that uh, was his host with his wife. And on a Saturday, I said, all right, let's spend the whole day. I'll take you to places that tourists don't go to. So for lunch, and I was in the city of Chicago then, uh, I took him to a very famous hot dog place called Fluky's. And we go there, and I say, order your hot dogs there at best, and get french fries. And if you've ever been to either Netherlands or Belgium, and by the way, in Belgium, they're called Belgian fries, not french fries. But anyways, if you go there, <coughs> how do they eat their french fries? Not with ketchup, with mayonnaise. So we go to Fluky's, and the guy's wife asked, could you get me some mayonnaise? <laughs> And we're at the counter when she asked that to the people. And they said, what are you talking about? Because they never asked that. And we'll look, and they somehow found some mayonnaise that they put in a little container. And lo and behold, the owner happened to be there and came to our table and said, what are you going to do with the mayonnaise? Because he was so astounded, because Americans don't eat french fries with mayonnaise, that he said that. And we told him how if you go to the Netherlands or Belgium, they always eat their french fries with mayonnaise, which is neither an acid or base, but it's all right, but I don't like it as much as ketchup. All right, any questions about acid bases or anything that might be concerning this on test number four? Going once, twice, make sure you know this.
yesterday I ended up talking about just two general reactions, and this gives you a taste of organic chemistry and functional groups. And by the way, if it looks like I'm having way too much fun, I am. And organic chemistry is the actual reactions and how do you predict what you're going to make and how do you use that to make things are based on general or specific functional groups that always react the same way. Like, over there, by the entrance to the room, there's a device called, oh, let me go over there and point it out, in case you're wondering what I'm looking at. There's a device here called a door. And what a door allows you to do is go from one space in a building to another. Can I come back? Yeah, I better come back. But anyways, when you came in this building, you went from one space outside to inside. Did you go through the same sort of thing that looked like this? No, it looks different. But you know, doors, however they look, are used for the same function. Well, in chemistry, organic chemistry, certain functional groups that means combination of atoms bond together, always found in a molecule, different molecules react the same way. And the one I ended up talking about was a double bond. And if you take a double bond that's made up of two different types of bonds that are different, for a test you won't have to know this, but I like to do it anyways. You have a pi and sigma bond. Pi bonds I can break like that. And what happens when you hydrogenate it, you break the pi bond, and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Well, in specific examples, Sometime in the future, you see something that, depending on my mood, is three or four points. And so, give the organic, when I say give, that means draw it. I could have written also draw. But I got to have it years ago, this writing down give. And for the following, and let's look at A. Now, how do you do this? You look for what's different in a molecule. In an organic molecule, you look for what's not a carbon-carbon single bond and what's not carbon or hydrogen, because that's where the fun is. That's where the functional group is. That's where all the action is. It's the fun part. And if we look here, what's different? Oh, carbon, hydrogen, single bond, double bond. How can you tell double bond? Two lines. And single bond. So the only place something's going to happen is right here unless you burn it, which we're not. It's called combustion. And immediately all I see is a double bond. I have the ability to shut things off in my brain. And I see the double bond. What am I reacting with? Hydrogen. What's nickel? A catalyst. Remember the catalysts are nickel, platinum, or palladium. And you break the pi, oh, it's even written on the board above. You break the pi bond, and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Now, one thing that when I teach Chem 1212 here, and I'll do it to you today, I brainwash my students. First one is, how many bonds to carbon always? Four. Does it look like it's in 3D and it's coming right at you? And anyways, the other thing is, 
you break carbon carbon single bond? And the answer is no, never, except for combustion. And one other reaction, which I'm not teaching, and I don't teach the other thing. So I have four carbons. All of them are bonded by single bonds, so I better end up with four carbons. Now, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to put a dot here and here to focus your attention. These are two carbons, these two, which become these two. I break the pi bond. Instead of having two, there's only one bond between it. Each carbon gets a hydrogen. I know there are four bonds to carbon, and therefore I can put in the rest of the hydrogens. This carbon has one bond, four minus one, three hydrogen. This carbon has one, two, three, three minus, four minus three, one hydrogen. Same thing here. This carbon has one line or bond. You all should have four. You fill in the rest, four minus one, three hydrogen. Now, you could have written this CH2 and this CH2, but why do extra work when, did I tell you I'm this close to the person grading test in this class? And therefore, this is why I let students do that. And since this is fun, I'm going to let you try one. Everybody got this down? Right at midnight, I'll be giving speed structure drawing lessons. Everybody got it? Good. By the way, if you came in late, don't forget to sign in, please. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's do this. Now, when you're looking at an organic molecule, what you should you be doing? Look for what's different. What's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen? You should get your attention. Oh, it's working good today. I uh, changed the batteries. But anyways, I that one, didn't you? Anyways. Double bond. You should get your attention like that. Ooh, it's really on fire. And I see that. As soon as I see that, 
The only thing I see is this. I'm reacting with hydrogen. Platinum is a catalyst. The catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And you break the pi bond, and each carbon and double bond gets a hydrogen. By the way, the closer it gets to Thanksgiving, the worse my hydrogen is so look on the board. It must be coming up soon. And now, do you break carbon, carbon, single bond? Never. Almost never. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six across. I have two CH3. By the way, these are called methyl groups. If you take organic chemistry, you learn that. Which two carbons have the double bond? These two, these two, become these two. Notice I broke that bond. And now, what do I do? I put two hydrogens. And now, I look at this and say, well, i got to put in the hydrogens. How do I know how many? Four bonds to carbon. Hopefully, you won't have any nightmares seeing me do this. But I brainwash all my students good about that. For those who know science fiction, when I put in hydrogens, I go at warp drive. So, meaning very fast, if I make a mistake, let me know. And the answer is I didn't. And this should be an H, not an extra bond. And now my finger's still clean. And that's how you do hydrogenation. Now, I'll wait until everybody gets it copied down. By the second week of, or 12 12, students are much faster. Practice makes perfect, I guess. Everybody got that down? All right. Now, it's important to know this. When I'm going to write on the board, do not write down. I just want to show you something. At my level, nobody's ever going to hire a PhD chemist or even a bachelor's degree chemist and say, if you're working for a company, they'll ask you, well, if I react this and this, what am I going to get? No, they're never going to ask you. What they're going to ask you is, is how do I make this compound And this is a very simple example. In real life, it's more complex. How do I make that compound from things that are cheap? And if they're a company that does hydrogenations, because they have the equipment, they'll ask, how do I do it hydrogenation and catalyst? Well, you look at that, you say, well, there are many ways of doing this. And one would be, think of this. If I had a double bond, I could buy it. And a lot of times, Mother Nature provides molecules like that. If I had a molecule with a double bond, it would do that. And now you use some logic. If I end up with five carbons, I better start with five carbons. And two of those carbons are going to have a double bond. I'll pick these two. I can pick others, too. And if I could buy this molecule, then I'd make that molecule when I hydrogenate it in my plant. And that's what people at my level do, figure out how to make things. What are things they make? The plastic of this monitor, the plastic that's in this bottle. Uh, how many of you use a fabric softener. A fabric softener. Back, I worked for a company, and, ooh, do I have time? Yeah, I'll do it Friday. And I'll show you other things. Let's move on. Now, organic chemistry switches off for this slide. It's in your daily life. Why learn organic chemistry? All your fats and oils are organic chemistry, organic molecule your carbohydrates. You know, the good things in life like potato chips, french fries, pizza, 
all have carbs in them, carbohydrates, that's organic chemistry, protein. Did I scare you already? Did I ask you to touch your skin? I think I did. Your skin is made up of protein that's organic. Polymers, the spore, the monitor, my eyeglasses, lenses, and then your hormones are also organic chemistry, which is responsible for my beard and other things, and saving your body doing things. Now, switches off. When you talk about fats and oils, they're called the triglycerides, and they're also known as triesters. Uh, you don't have to write this down. I'll just give you a quick taste. I've worked in this industry. All fats and oils have this structure. This is an ester, this is an ester, so there are three esters. R, R prime, and R double prime, R X, Y, and Z. And they have different amounts of carbon, and with or without a double bond. And all your fats and oils have that structure. And a quick little thing, what's a fat? Uh, test, uh, switch, will this be on test is off? A fat is one of these that's a solid or semi-solid room temperature. How many of you have ever cooked bacon and if you look at the frying pan, after a while the liquid in there becomes a solid? That's because it's a fat. It's bacon grease, which has a name. Oil is liquid at room temperature. Switches off of here only because I worked in this industry. Uh, what are some of the oils? Now, there's beef fat. Now, in the chemical industry, we call that tallow. There's pig's fat. In the chemical industry, we call that yellow grease and white grease, different grades. How important are tallow and white grease and yellow grease? The many things you buy, such as your cosmetics and personal care items, like your hand lotions, your soap, and everything, are based on the price of tallow. There's a formula in the contract between companies and or pig's fat, which is really white grease and yellow grease. How important is that? Well, every week, if you know where to look, and I do, because I worked in this industry, first of all, there's a weekly magazine called the Chemical Marketing Reporter, CMR. They have those prices. Then there's this other newspaper, I think it's called, that has every week, if you know where to look, the price per pound of tallow and white grease and yellow grease. What's the name of that? Oh, it's something called the Wall Street Journal. That's how important this is. Every week they have that in the Wall Street Journal on Fridays. So you can look for that. Oh, one other interesting thing. How many of you have ever used rapeseed oil for cooking? Most of the world, especially underdeveloped countries, use rapeseed oil. It comes from a plant called the rapeseed. A lot of it's grown in Canada because it's quite inexpensive. Many years ago, they tried to sell rapeseed oil for cooking oil in the United States, and people who buy cooking oil, like the housewives, no, nah, I buy rapeseed oil? Yeah. So people up in Canada at this one um, association, someone there got real smart and said, let's change the name. It's made in Canada, and it's an oil that's liquid at room temperature, Let's call it Canada oil. Canola oil. How many of you have seen canola oil for sale? That's really rapeseed oil, but people won't buy the stuff when it's got that name on there. And interesting marketing ploy that worked quite well. Now, switches off. If you react to fat or oil with acid and water, as happens in your stomach, you make things called fatty acids and glycerin, which your body uses. All right, switches on. If I could turn the knob to 100 and it only goes to 10, I can turn it to 100. It's time for you to learn how to get clean. And that is how to soap work. And that's organic chemistry. You mean when I wash my hands, that's organic? Yes. Now, when you use soap, you're using something called a surfactant. 
And surfactant is short for surface activation and something that, <coughs> excuse me, interacts at the surface of things. Where? Your hand, the dirt, and water. Okay? So that's the surfactant. Remember, everything up here is on Blackboard for your perusal, whatever you want. Now, if we look at soap, and this is something you should know, and I'll write it on the board, all soaps, and it turns out the churches too, have the following structure. These are carbons normally. It has a very long nonpolar tail. through copying the slide. Don't forget to write down know this. For those who came in late, Friday, I'll be going through the org talk. No, Monday. Friday, I'll do a review for test number four, and I'll also do some organic problems before our lab. The lab is quick, it only takes about 10 hours. All right, everybody got a copy down? All right, so has a structure, nonpolar tail, and what we call a polar head. How many of you use bar soap? If you look at bar soap, it's really got this structure. This is one of the molecules called sodium stearate. You might see sodium talloid. You also have one with 18 carbons, a 16. So this is your long polar tail. This is your Nonpolar tail, polar head. Now, the important key to the whole puzzle of how soap works is like the solids like, which I taught earlier in solutions. And that is things that are polar or soluble in polar things. Things that are nonpolar are soluble in nonpolar things. And things that are different are not soluble in each other. So let's look at important things. Well, I don't know about you, but when I wash my hands, I use water. And if you just had dirt or grease on your hand, you go like this under water, oh, they're still dirty. Why? Because water is polar. Now, what you don't know, but I'll teach you now, which is important to how soap works, is dirt, and yes, it's been analyzed, is nonpolar. And grease, which is another thing you try and get off things, is also nonpolar. If you try and mix the two together, nothing happens, which is why your hands stay dirty. So what do you use? You use soap. Oh, by the way, uh, a couple years ago I was watching cable TV. There's a commercial for some laundry detergent. And I was sitting in my lace boy chair in my family room. And it said, and it even cleans greasy dirt. And I almost fell off my chair laughing. Come on, greasy dirt, they're both not polar. Doesn't matter which is which. But anyways, let's assume you can see my hand right here. There's a little piece of dirt there, pretend there is. And I put it under water. And the water sees the dirt and says, wait, I'm polar. You didn't know water could talk, I can't. Got to listen for it. I have a hard time, but I can still hear it with my ear. Boy, that's a lame joke. But anyways, dirt is nonpolar. The water sees the dirt and says, you're nonpolar, I'm polar. 
I know like the sounds like, we're not going anywhere together, because you're nonpolar, nonpolar. Well, now you use some soap, and you go like this. And the soap molecules have a nonpolar tail. And they look at the dirt and say, dirt, you're nonpolar, my tail is nonpolar, let's line up like this. And a lot of molecules do this. And what it really does is totally surround the dirt particle with the soap molecules lined up that way. And it would look like this. In the center, they cut off a part of where the molecules would also be. You have a piece of dirt. Surrounding it, all 360 degrees, you have the soap molecules where the tails are going toward, and the outside, you have the polar head. All right, everybody, you should know this is called a micelle. And a micelle is a dirt particle surrounded by soap molecules where the nonpolar tails are toward the dirt and the polar heads are around it. And now water looks at this and says, huh, water looks at the micelle and all it sees is the polar heads. And the water says, oh, micelle, you're polar, I'm polar, Let's go down the drain together. And guess what? Your hands are clean. If you did your laundry, your shirt, or whatever you laundered, your towels are clean. And now you're happy. Well, at least I hope you are. And that's how soap works. You should know this. There are a couple things I'm going to ask you to know leaving my class. One of them is how soap works. So if somebody comes to you and taps you on the shoulder and you're on the street or in a parking lot, you can explain to them how, actually, they'll have to do it for test number four and the final. Oops, I gave it away. All right, instant replay. Let's go through this again. How do you, how does soap work? First thing you should know, soap has a nonpolar tail polar head. This is the structure of all soaps and detergent. By the way, how many of you are familiar with laundry detergent? If you do your own laundry, you want to know. And laundry detergents, since the end of World War II, the late 1950s, when organic chemists found a way to make this, this you don't have to. I worked in this industry, so I know it. This you don't have to. All laundry detergents have this structure. They have put other things in there to help it work better, but this is called LAS, linear alcohol sulfonase, and R is 12 to 9 to 12 carbon. This is called a benzene ring. This is nonpolar polar head. Anyways, how does the church, uh, how does soap work? Soap, you should know, not this one, but this one, you should know how to draw it down, and then it has a nonpolar tail, polar head. The most important thing, how soap works, notice I went to a real large font because it's so important, is light dissolves light. It's a rule of thumb, which means polar things are soluble and polar things. Nonpolar things are soluble and nonpolar. You mix the two together, it doesn't happen. And you should know water is polar. Dirt and grease are nonpolar. And when you wash your hands or anything else with soap or detergent, same thing happens. The dirt molecule, which is nonpolar, attracts the nonpolar tails of the dirt molecule and forms a micelle. You should know what a micelle is and how to draw it. Next, because of the structure of a micelle, see I should have it here, you know this, and 
you have the outside looks totally polar. So water comes along and says, oh, my cell, you're polar, I'm polar, I know life the cells like, let's go down the drain together, and lo and behold, your hands are clean. Or your clothes, your dishes, if you wash your car, same thing, all those are using the same principle. And now you know how it worked. And I was, one second, I was probably the only one in this Chicagoland area, maybe not, but I bet I was. This morning when I was washing my hands, I looked and said, oh, I'm making my cells. And I understood what was going on. What's an example, like a test question that you can give us? Explain how soap works, 10 points each, or 10 points. Hold on, I'll write it on the board. Hard to make it date, but how companies jump on to chemical terms a couple of years ago a student of mine in an organic came and showed me this and I'm not getting a kickback from this company. There are a number of them that sell it. And it's skin cleaner, which is my cellular cleansing. And if you look at the ad, and the student brought me an ad from a magazine talking about how the my cells in this product, I started laughing. No, there's soap in the product, and there's no my cells until it interacts with the dirt on your face or your makeup. And but Whoever was in marketing and sales, usually they don't know science the way chemists do, they'll write things like this, and there's no buy cells in these products until you put it on your face. So that always interests me. And there are a number of people who now sell it because it's, I've been told I don't buy it, I just use your bar soap, and if you notice, I forgot to put my makeup on today. But, wait, no, nope, I didn't put my... Uh, mascara. By the way, mascara and makeup is really heavy-duty, sophisticated organic chemistry. How many of you have used the eye line, eyelash liner where they sell it? You too. All right. Looks good on you. But anyways, uh, remember I have a fraternity education. I always have to come back. But anyways, uh, in the last couple of years, how it doesn't wash off when it gets wet, that's organic chemistry making it hydrophobic. Life dissolves life. Anyways, I thought I'd point it out. Let's move on. Another thing I'd like you to learn, and that is how do towels work, or paper towels. Have you ever used those magic things in your home? Your hands are wet, you go up to this magic thing, and you go like this on them, with it, and all of a sudden your hands are dry, and that magic device is called a towel. Well, towels are made with cotton. You don't have to draw the structure on them. But this is the structure of cotton. And cotton has a lot of, we call these a carbon with an OH group. It's called an alcohol or hydroxyl group. Now, anytime you have an oxygen with a hydrogen on it bonded to things, it can hydrogen bond.
the most important one is water. Water is a liquid instead of a gas right now in this room, in this bottle, in our blood because of hydrogen bonding. It's not a true chemical bond. It's a very weak force, but it's a very important force. Well, if you have a towel, with, this is called the hydroxyl group, and it can hydrogen bond to the water. And that's how towels work. When you go like this, you're giving on the towel, you're giving the towel, oh, hold on. Important demonstration. By the way, these are great, you get them at Walmart, they're microfiber ones for cleaning glasses. But if my hands were wet and I went like this, lo and behold, they're dry. How did that magic happen? Right before your very eyes, you're forming a hydrogen bond from the water and the towel. And it gets it off your skin, which has a very few sites that can hydrogen bond to water. But it's stronger to the towel, and that's how it works. So I was probably the only one in my neighborhood this morning when I got out of my shower and was doing this and said, oh, I'm hydrogen bonding water. Now you know he's a chemist. Now, how many of you ever had with time towels don't work that well? And that's called rewet. And I've worked in this industry. And how do you know that? Well, it doesn't absorb water. Why? If you're using a fabric softener, the fabric softener will block this from hydrogen bonding. This won't be on top. By the way, I'm going to guess your question. What kind of question would be with this on a test? And the question would be, how do towels work? And the answer is, they hydrogen bond. All I hear. And that's something else I'd like you to learn. So if you're ever at a party and see someone using a napkin, by the way, paper, more napkins than this. This paper has a chemical over the actual paper, which is similar to cotton, that blocks that from hydrogen bonding and also keeps the ink on there. But paper towels and also napkins, which are really paper towels, don't have that, and they also hydrogen bond. And so the question would be how the towels work the hydrogen bond. Now, when you use a fabric softener, it blocks some of these, a lot of them, from hydrogen bonding. And that's why it won't absorb water. That's called rewet. You know how you make towels work new again? You wash them a couple times without a fabric softener. That strips off the fabric softener. Now it can once again hydrogen bond, and you're all nice and happy. Ooh, that reminds me. How many of you ever heard the term, this fabric breathes? Have you heard that? And I'm thinking, wait a second, it's not alive. What do they mean? How they came up with the term breathe, don't know. But what they're really meaning is, this fabric can hydrogen bond. And what that means is, if you're working out, it's the summer, and your men sweat, women perspire, and you don't want that, you want to cool off, the fabric will hydrogen bond to that water and get it off you and make you feel more comfortable. One of the worst experiences, do I have time? Oh, I do. Um, back before everybody in here except me was born, uh, back when I was in college, they had this craze called disco, which I wasn't into disco. And uh, that thing then, the clothing, with things made of polyester. Hold on, I got a whole two minutes, so settle down. And polyester has no hydroxyl groups and can't hydrogen bond. And it's sort of like the inside a wetsuit, scuba diving. It was uncomfortable. And my mother, oh, and she went out and got, took me and we got polyester pants, a, a sports jacket, and some polyester shirts. And wearing that, I felt like I was in a totally closed rubber sweatsuit. Oh, I hated it. And then when Disco went out, I had even donate that to the Salvation Army that went right into the garbage. I, I don't have to wear that anymore. 
That's your cause, so it wouldn't breathe. All right. I'll talk about this on Friday, because all of you are all antsy to run away. So I'll see you on Friday. Don't forget, bring your to-do list. Uh,